Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to our second tutorial, which is going to be on CryptoVerif. It's going to be led by Bruno Blanchet from Indria Paris, and he's going to be assisted by Benjamin Lip. Like in the previous tutorial, if you and if you were not attending that tutorial, then the rule is that you sign up to Zulip and ask all your questions over there. At regular points during this tutorial, Bruno will take a little break and answer some of the questions on Zulip, or there might be other people on Zulip already answering your questions in real time. So let's get this started. Let's transfer it over to Bruno. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, and welcome back everybody. I'm going to uh, share uh, my screen. Um, let's start. So uh, as Kartik said, I'm going to uh, present you CryptoVerif. And um, actually uh, the talk will be in two parts. So in the first part, I'm going to give you an introduction with very small examples. And then uh, Benjamin Lip is going to explain a slightly more involved example in the second part. And there will be a five minute break between the two. So first my part. So I'm going to begin with an introduction, giving a general idea what CryptoVerif is. Then I'm going to present a very small example, which is uh, the Encrypt and Mac scheme. And we are going to prove two uh, properties of this scheme uh, using CryptoVerif, so that it's in CPA and in CTXT. Obviously, I'm going to explain what, what this means. And then I'm going to conclude uh, on various examples handled by CryptoVerif and give uh, some future directions. So, uh, CryptoVerif is a mechanized proof that works in the computational model of cryptography. So this is the model typically used by cryptographers, so probably by most of you. And it's not the same model as Tamarin, which works in the symbolic model. So in the computational model, messages are bit strings. Cryptographic primitives are functions from bit strings to bit strings. And the adversary can be uh, any probabilistic Turing machine. So again, that's what cryptographers usually do. Uh, so CryptoVerif generates proof by sequences of games. So uh, it's a prover, it doesn't find attacks. Uh, for finding attacks, you can use uh, Tamarine or ProVerif, for example. Uh, it proves secrecy, authentication, indistinguishability properties. And we're going to see some examples uh, during the, the talk. Uh, one interesting point is that it provides a generic method for specifying many uh, different properties of cryptographic primitives. So for example, you can specify max, symmetric encryption, public key encryption, and so on. And for each of these primitives, you can have various security notions that can uh, specify details of what security properties you have. So for example, for symmetric encryption, it can be in CPA, uh, in CTXT, in, in CCA2, uh, you can satisfy plain text integrity, and so on. So you have a, a huge variety of of properties for each primitive. Um, it works for a number of sessions that is polynomial in the security parameter in the presence of an active adversary. And it also uh, gives you a bound of the probability of success of an attack. So this is the so-called exact security uh, framework. And this bound is a function of uh, the number of sessions of your protocol, so num the number of Oracle calls in the more cryptographic wording, and uh, the probability of breaking each of the primitives that your protocol uses. Uh, and CryptoVerif has two modes. So it has an automatic proof strategy. So you can just give the um, protocol that you want to prove, run the tool, and it will try to prove it. Or you can also guide it manually. Uh, um, so in the talk today, we are mostly going to see automatic examples because these are uh, simpler examples. So for, I guess for most of you, it's going to be a reminder, but uh, just to be sure that everybody knows that at least a little bit what proofs by sequences of games are. So in, in these proofs, uh, the first game is the real protocol or system that you want to verify. And uh, you um, run this protocol in interaction with some adversary. And then uh, 
step by step, you're going to transform this initial game into another game. Uh, and at each transformation step, you can use syntactic transformations like uh, replacing a variable with its value or, or something simple like that. Or you can rely on a security assumption on a primitive and do a proof by reduction basically to, to the security assumption on your primitive. And one important point is that the probability of distinguishing two consecutive games is always negligible. So the difference of advantage that you observe between consecutive games is negligible. And in the final game, uh, the, this last game is ideal. This means that the security property is of use just by looking at the form of the game. So typically the advantage of the adversary is going to be zero uh, in this game. And then, so you, you get the sequence of games like that. You start from the game zero, you have a negligible probability difference, and then you get game, game one, then again, a negligible probability difference and so on, until here the properties of use on the uh, probability of winning for the adversary is zero. And then in the initial game, the probability of winning will be P1, etc., plus P2, plus Pn, plus the probability in the final game, which is zero. And that proves the property uh, in the initial game. So that's the basic proof principle that CryptoVirus uses. So in practice, when you want to uh, use the tool, you uh, prepare an input file that contains the specification of the protocol that you want to study. So this is the initial game. It also specifies the security assumptions that you make on the various cryptographic primitives that you use. And then uh, you also specify the security properties that you want to prove. Then you run the tool. And um, if everything goes well, it's going, it's going to output a sequence of games that corresponds to the proof, a short explanation of the transformations that are performed between the different games, and an upper bound of the probability of success of an attack against the properties that you wanted to prove. Um, so uh, sometimes um, it doesn't work that well and uh, the proof fails. So in that case, it's going to output a sequence of games, but the final game uh, does not enable the tool to prove the property. So um, in that case, um, you need to look at that final game and see uh, what you can do, what transformation you can apply, and, and typically you're going to use the, uh, the interactive mode in that case. So uh, in order to mechanize the proofs, we need to um, formalize them in uh, a game uh, a probabilistic process calculus that is a small uh, specialized programming language. So uh, this uh, pro process calculus is probabilistic and uh, the processes basically define the oracles that the adversary can call. And the runtime of the processes is bounded. So uh, this means that uh, there is a, a bounded number of calls to each oracle. So here I wrote on the slide the bounded number of copies of the processes, that's the same thing. And also the length of messages that are given as input to oracles is bounded. Um, then I'm going to give you a quick summary of the main uh, syntax uh, constructs of the uh, language of CryptoVerif. And obviously you're going to see uh, examples of that uh, later in the talk, so don't worry. So in this language, terms uh, represent computations and messages, and messages are bit strings. So these terms can be variables that contain some bit strings, and they can be function applications. So you apply a function like encryption, for example, to uh, some arguments. And these function symbols correspond to functions from bit strings to bit strings that are uh, computable by deterministic Turing machines. So we don't allow uh, function symbols to represent probabilistic functions, but we can still represent probability, probabilistic function by choosing random coins a priori, and then uh, calling a function with these coins as argument and uh, how to choose random coins, we are going to see that now in the process calculus. 
So in this process calculus, you can define um, uh, various oracles. So uh, the processes Q uh, represent oracle definitions. And in particular, they can be uh, an oracle definition like that. So an oracle O that takes as argument X1, Xm. And these variables X1, Xm have type T1, Tm. And these types are just sets of B strings. So you can have a type that is the set of all B strings or a type that is uh, a set of nonces of a certain length or a set of keys of a certain length and so on. And then the process P here is going to say what uh, the oracle can actually do. And we're going to, to see what this process P can contain. And these oracle definitions, you can combine them. You can have uh, the, this construct, which is called a replication. So for each i smaller than n do q, uh, it means that you're going to consider n copies of the process Q, which defines an oracle. So for, that allows you to define an oracle that you can call at most n times. And then when you want to define several oracles, you can put them in parallel, like, like this construct, Q parallel Q prime. So the oracles defined in Q are uh, available to the adversary at the same time as the oracle uh, defined in Q prime. And this uh, zero process does nothing. So it's not so important. It's uh, the anti uh, oracle definition. So when we have an oracle definition like this one, uh, what can we do uh, in the body of the oracle? We can uh, yield here, so it just uh, returns with an error, basically, that's the, that's the intuition. You can return some result, uh, which is going to be a tuple of B strings, M1, MM. And then after you return the result, you can define other oracles that become available to the adversary at that point. You can execute an event, E of M1, MM, and then execute some other process P. And an event is used to specify some security properties. So for example, in cryptographic proofs, uh, when you apply Schoop's lemma, you typically introduce an event, and then you prove that this, that this event has negligible probability. This is a particular case of an event uh, that we can introduce by this construct. Uh, another example is you want to prove that if some participant uh, runs with some nonce uh, or yes, some nonce n, then some other participant also uses that nonce. So you can use an event to say that the participant runs the protocol with a certain nonce or with a certain key. And then you put the nonce or the key as argument here. Uh, here you have the random, gener random number generation. So you choose randomly a random number x inside the set of B strings t, and then you run the process p. Here, this is the assignment. You compute a value in the term m, and then you uh, store it in x. And t is just the type, and generally you can omit it, uh, because CryptoVerif is going to infer uh, the type. And, and then you can continue doing other computation with p. There is the conditional, so if m is true, you run p, otherwise you run p prime. And there are two constructs for lists. So you can insert an element m1, mn, in a list L, and then you run P. And the second construct uh, is going to do a lookup in the list. So it looks for an element X1, Xm in the list L, such that the condition M is satisfied. And if the condition is satisfied, you run P. And if you then do not find any element that satisfies the condition M, then you run uh, P prime. So if you look at this calculus, uh, some constructs should be fairly familiar. So for example, the random number generation here, it's essentially the same syntax that you have in cryptographic games that you write by hand. The assignment also is typically represented by an, uh, an arrow in games that you uh, write by hand. Some of the constructs are fairly standard, like the test is then else, I guess everybody understands. Uh, this syntax uh, on list, insert and get, is probably less familiar, but still uh, you have certainly seen in the cryptographic proofs, uh, places where you add an, uh, an element to a list and then you test if some element that satisfies certain conditions is present in the list. So this is a non-standard syntax, but for something that should be fairly standard. Um, 
So the Oracle definition is also something fairly standard, uh, perhaps with a slightly different syntax, but it's basically the idea. And uh, the for each is certainly non-standard. Uh, in typical cryptographic proofs, you have a sentence in English saying that uh, this Oracle is called at most a certain number of times. So instead of having this kind of sentence in English, we uh, write this syntactic construct in uh, CryptoVerif. Uh, so I think it's a good time to answer questions. Let's see. Oh, uh, what does bond mean? So um, the uh, I guess you're talking about the replication bond uh, here. So it's the maximum value of the uh, index i. So it means that you have n copies of the process q, which are numbered from one to n. So um, it allows you to talk about the second execution, for example, of the process queue and saying that you're, and then it means that all oracles inside queue can be called at most n times and n is, is the bound on, on the number of calls. Uh, can, uh, another question, can lack of arriving at proof by the tool be considered as an attack? Uh, no, so uh, crypto verif, tries to do a proof. When it does a proof, then you, you have a proof that this is secure. Um, but if there is, if CryptoVerif doesn't find the proof, uh, several situations can happen. It can happen that it is an attack, but it can also happen that the tool is too limited to do your proof. It can happen that you did not guide the tool properly. And if you guide it in a different way, it will manage to prove the, the property. It can happen that your assumptions are a bit too weak, but uh, using a slightly different crypto assumption, you're going to, to be able to prove your protocol. So it's definitely not uh, always an attack when the proof fails. So when you want to uh, see if there is an attack, you can use uh, symbolic tools like uh, Tamarin or Proverif. And in particular, uh, in a a subset of the CryptoVerif language is compatible with ProVerif and you can also run ProVerif directly on the same examples for simple examples. And that allows you to, to find the text. Um, okay, what else? Uh, yeah, so somebody asked me to, to explain the result of, on a simple example. Uh, so let me do that a bit later. I'm going to show you examples. Um, the probabilistic process calculus, is it the pi calculus? Uh, so in some sense, yes, the syntax is close to the pi calculus, uh, but uh, the semantics is very different from the standard uh, pi calculus semantics. So the uh, semantics here is probabilistic, while the uh, standard semantics in the PyCalculus is uh, non-deterministic. So in, you can choose uh, to which channel you ch send messages in a non-deterministic non way in the PyCalculus. And here, uh, we completely avoid non-determinism. Everything is probabilistic. Okay. Uh, so does uh, semicolon p mean you run a new instance of p recursively or just continue with p? So just continue with p. So p is the, well, you'll see in examples, but p is what you do after. Which element is inserted in which list in L of M1, MN? So you insert the element M1, MN inside the list L. So L is the list and M1, MN is the element that you insert. Uh, if there is no uh, for each, then you can call the oracle only once. Um, and is N equals infinity possible? No, but N is a, an argument, a parameter 
So n is not a constant like one, two, three. It's a parameter, so it's not a real fixed bound. You, the, essentially, the adversary can call the oracles as many times as it wants when it's replicated, and n is the number of calls that the adversary has made. So um, yeah, in the list, um, yeah, um, yeah. The the element that you insert is a tuple m1 mn. So it's a single element of your list that is a tuple. And here in the get, you get a single element that is a tuple. And it's possible that several there are several elements that satisfy the condition, and in that case, one of them is chosen randomly. And uh, yeah, there is also a question on the for each. So the for each, the n is necessarily a variable; it cannot be a constant. Okay, so let's go uh, to uh, the encrypt and max scheme now. So. Uh, as the name says, encrypt and MAC, I need an encryption scheme and a MAC scheme to be able to define encrypt and MAC. So first I'm going to consider a symmetric encryption scheme uh, that is probabilistic and that reveals the length uh, of the clear text. So this scheme consists of two uh, functions, a randomized encryption function, onc R, that takes as argument the message that you encrypt, the encryption key, on some random coins. So onc r itself is deterministic, but it takes as argument random coins, and so that allows us to model a probabilistic uh, computation. And then uh, we can define uh, as an abbreviation onc of mk, which is going to uh, choose random coins, and then compute onc r with these random coins uh, r. So now I, I can, thanks to this abbreviation, I can um, keep the random coins implicit. Uh, but still, CryptoVerif is always going to expand the abbreviation and actually internally always work uh, with this form of the code. And then there is the decryption function, which takes a ciphertext on the key and returns uh, the corresponding clear text. And you have this equation, which says that when you decrypt a cipher text and the key k is the same. Uh, the random coins do not matter. And then you're get, going to get the message m. There is still this function here that is really unusual and probably strange to uh, all of you. Uh, let me explain. So the decryption uh, can return either a bit string when the decryption succeeds or a special uh, symbol button, which means that the decryption fails. So the, type, the written type of the decryption is a bit string union and the special symbol button. But the type of uh, messages, M, is bit string. The message cannot be button. So uh, if I write that deck of onc uh, equals M, then there is a type error here because the message doesn't have the same type as the, as the decryption. So to solve this problem, I, has, I have a function inchbot, which maps messages in the set of these strings to uh, the same messages, so it's basically the identity, but now in the set of this string union button. And so uh, now I have solved the type error on, just by writing this function symbol in addition to uh, instead of writing just M. Okay, now uh, the MAC uh, scheme. So um, the MAC function, um, MAC of MK takes as input the message M and uh, the MAC key K, and is going to return uh, the MAC. And the verification function, verify, it takes as argument the uh, message, the key, and a candidate MAC, and is going to return true when the verification succeeds and false when the, when the verification fails. And uh, typically, you have this equation, 
saying that when you verify a Mac on you, the message on the key is, is the same. So you, is, here is the correct Mac, then it's going to always return true. So informally, a Mac is essentially a keyed hash function. You can see it like that. Uh, so some kind of intuition. And a Mac is going to guarantee the integrity of the message because only someone who knows uh, the secret key K can build the Mac and so can uh, the adversary uh, should not be able to forge the Mac. So we are going to formalize that uh, later. And now using encryption on Mac, I can define the encrypt and Mac scheme. So it's again an encryption scheme that combines the two. So uh, the encryption function takes as argument the message that you're going to encrypt and a key, but now the key uh, has two components. There's the key for the encryption scheme and the key for the Mac scheme. And this encryption is going to call the underlying uh, encryption scheme with the message on the key that returns the ciphertext C1. And I'm going to uh, concatenate the ciphertext C1 with the Mac, which is uh, the Mac of C1 using the Mac key uh, MK. So that's my encryption. So that's a mathematical formula, if you like, that defines this encryption. Now let's see the CryptoVerif code for defining the encryption. It's that. So I define a function that is a full onc of M, so the message that I want to encrypt, and the two keys, uh, the key for the encryption scheme and the key for the Mac. I compute uh, the ciphertext C1, which is onc of MK, and I concatenate that with uh, the Mac. So here is the concatenation of C1 computed above with the Mac of C1 and the MK. And that's the result of my function. And now uh, I can also define a decryption function for this scheme. So this decryption function is going to receive uh, the ciphertext as argument and the two keys, uh, the um, key for the encryption and the key for the Mac. And uh, what it's going to do is uh, split the ciphertext into two parts. One that is uh, the uh, ciphertext for the encryption scheme and uh, the MAC tag. So this is done by a kind of pattern matching uh, construct that is written here. So C is already known and CryptoVerif is going to try to match uh, C with something of this form. That is the concatenation of uh, C1 and MAC1 and it's going to define the variables C1 and MAC1 using the value of C. So it splits C into two, two parts. And it's possible in the unique way because the length of the Mac uh, is fixed. So now that I have split uh, this ciphertext into its two components, I'm going to verify uh, the Mac here. And if the verification succeeds, then I decrypt the ciphertext. And this is the result of my decryption. Otherwise, uh, the decryption fails, and so I return the special symbol bottom. And moreover, if the pattern matching here fails, so in practice, what this means is, for example, that the ciphertext is too short, it's even shorter than the MAC tag, so it can certainly not be uh, a good ciphertext for the encrypted MAC scheme. So in that case, the pattern matching fails, and uh, I return bottom, so the, the decryption for the encrypted MAC scheme fails. Okay, so this is the scheme. Uh, we need some assumptions on the primitives. So the two primitives are the encryption and the MAC. And um, these assumptions are uh, typically already specified in a library of primitives that uh, CryptoVerif knows about. And you can simply reuse them uh, without manually uh, redefining them. So um, in the example that we consider, uh, the Mac is supposed to be uh, strongly unforgeable under chosen message attacks, which is written SUFCMA. So it means that an adversary that has access to the Mac on the verification oracles has a negligible probability of forging a Mac, obviously not a Mac uh, produced by the Mac oracle. Uh, and the encryption 
is supposed to be in CPA, so it means indistinguishable from the chosen plain text attacks. So it means that an adversary has a negligible probability of distinguishing the encryption of two messages of the same length, and these two messages are chosen by the adversary. So in this um, encrypt and MAC example, we want to prove that it is uh, in CPA and in CTXT. So we are going to uh, do these two proofs, uh, one after the other. So perhaps I can look if there are more questions. So a question about the types. So the return types is in the maybe monad. Um, I guess you're talking about encryption. So you could understand that. So the, the indeed you you can say that. Uh, the introvert function can be seen as some kind of option type or, or maybe monad that uh, bottom corresponds to the non option and, and uh, the inch bot of something corresponds to some this thing. Um, yeah, how, how does full deck know how to split? Uh, yeah, indeed. It, as it assumes a length on the Mac. Okay, so the, about the length of the Mac, um, so the way you specify it is just that you you say as an assumption that this concatenation function is injective in the sense that you can re recover and you can recover efficiently the two these two arguments and then it's uh, up to you when you implement the protocol to make sure that it is actually injective so uh, we're going to see that in the code we just have an assumption saying that it's injective and, and then you it's uh, when you implement the protocol, you need to implement this concatenation function by an injective function, and you need to give also the uh, the inverse function that allows you to recover uh, C1 and MAC1 from the concatenation. Um, so when you uh, have the equation, uh, saying that verify uh, yeah, this equation verify of the Mac is true. It does not say anything for uh, what happens when you verify with something that is not equal to the correct Mac. It just says what is written, that is when you pass a Mac as argument to verify on the keys on message match, then it's true. What happens uh, in other cases is specified by the security assumption. So it's the strong affordability that we, is going to give you information on what happens when the, uh, you verify with potentially something else. And that we're going to see later. Okay. Uh, the full deck part. So let me uh, try to re explain very shortly the full deck. So it takes as argument uh, a ciphertext on the uh, encryption and MAC key. It's going first to decompose the um, ciphertext into uh, the MAC tag, MAC1, and the ciphertext for the uh, underlying encryption scheme, which is C1. If the, this decomposition fails, it returns bottom in the S branch. So it means that the full decryption failed. If the decomposition succeeds, it's going to verify the MAC. And if the verification of the MAC succeeds, it's going to decrypt. And if the decryption succeeds, it's good, you, you have your clear text. If the verification of the MAC uh, fails, 
you return bottom, it means that the decryption in the encrypted MAC uh, scheme failed. Okay, so now I'm going to um, do the proof um, of the INCPA property for the encrypted MAC uh, scheme. So how do I uh, do this proof? So first I'm going to start with the definition of uh, INCPA. So in this definition, we consider an experiment here in which we choose a random bit B, zero or one. We uh, generate a random key K for the uh, encrypted MAC scheme. And then we have an adversary that has access to this uh, left or right encryption oracle. So let me explain a little bit. So this LR function uh, returns its first argument X when the last argument is zero and uh, its second argument when the last argument is one and is defined only when the first two arguments have the same length. So here this oracle is going to take as argument two messages uh, let's say m0 and m1. If the bit b is 0, it's going to encrypt m0 under the key k. If the bit b is 1, it's going to encrypt uh, m1 under k. So the adversary has access to this oracle that encrypts either m0 or m1. And then the job of the adversary is to try to guess the bit b. So the adversary is going to output a bit uh, B prime and the adversary wins when B prime is equal to B. Uh, there is obviously one trick because if the adversary just chooses a bit randomly and returns that as B prime, then uh, it has a probability of winning, which is one half. So uh, to take that into account, we adjust the probability here. We multiply the probability of winning by two and uh, subtract one so that um, the, uh, the advantage of the adversary is the in interval zero one and not in the interval uh, one half one. And finally, here we have the probability of success of an adversary against the NCPA scheme, which is the maximum of this uh, probability for all adversaries that run uh, in time at most t on call uh, the left or right encryption oracle at most QE times of, on messages on, of length at most L. So this is the detailed uh, formal definition. So I want to prove that this uh, encrypt and MAC scheme is in CPA. What I need to do is basically to program in CryptoVerif the in CPA experiment. So this part here, I need to uh, program it in CryptoVerif. So let's see how we do that. Uh, the first step is an initialization oracle. So in CryptoVerif, you all, everything that you program is an oracle. So uh, even that part here is going to be uh, programmed as an oracle. So this oracle is called OSTART and uh, it first chooses a random bit B in the set uh, bool, which is zero one. Then it chooses a random key for the encrypt and max scheme. But for the encrypt and max scheme, the key in fact is two things. It's the key for the encrypt is nothing. It just gives back the control to the adversary, but the result is nothing. So you have the code for O start here. Now, uh, after O start, we need to program the uh, left or right encrypt oracle that we uh, give to the adversary. So uh, here we uh, first say that um, this left or right encryption oracle can be called at most q -unc times. And then this oracle takes as argument two messages, m1 and m2. First is going to uh, check that these two messages have the same length. And the test here is uh, a bit unusual probably. In fact, the function z is a function that uh, maps a b-string x to a b-string of the same length that contains only zeros. So uh, if z of m1 is equal to z of m2, it actually means that uh, the length of m1 
is the same as the length of M2. So um, when uh, M1 and M2 have the same length, I'm going to define a message M0, which is uh, either M1 or M2, depending on the value of the bit B. And then M0 is the message that I'm actually going to encrypt. So the result of this encryption oracle will be full ANC of M0 uh, encrypted under uh, K, uh, the key for encryption, and uh, MK, the key for the MAC. Um, okay, so that I explained already. Uh, so to summarize, we get this uh, code for the initial game, which uh, as first, uh, first defines the oracle O start here. And then this oracle is uh, followed. So the semicolon here says that this part becomes available after uh, oracle O start is executed. And indeed, we really need to execute the oracle O start first because we need to have the keys K and MK in order to uh, compute here the, the encryption. And then uh, in this game, what do we want to prove? We want to prove the secrecy of the bit B. So here, uh, there's a small simplification. So if you remember the, in, the NCPA experiment, uh, we have an adversary that returns a bit B prime and then we test whether a B prime is equal to B. So here we, uh, in a slightly simpler way, uh, we are simply uh, going to prove that B is secret and then CryptoVerif proves that the adversary has no information at all on the bit B, which is what we want to prove. Uh, so let me show you the uh, example CryptoVerif file. Yeah, so you should see it. Um, so in this file, you have uh, some more declarations that I did not mention in my explanations. So first here, I declare a parameter QONC, which is going to be the number of calls to the Oracle uh, OONC. So I need to declare all these parameters using this param declaration. Then I declare the types. So you have the type for Mac keys, the type for encryption keys, and the type for the Macs, so the tags that are added to messages. All these types are annotated with the fixed uh, label. So it means that uh, they correspond to a set of B strings of fixed length. So for example, the keys can be a 128 bit length, for example. Um, then we define the assumptions for uh, the symmetric uh, encryption scheme that we use. First, we define a probability, p -onc, where it says that p -onc is going to be the probability of breaking the NCPA property of encryption. So it just def defines a symbol p -onc, that is a probability. And then here you have the call to the macro uh, NCPA symmetric encryption. So this is the name of the ma macro NCPA sim -onc. Yeah. That defines uh, an NCPA symmetric encryption scheme. Uh, this macro takes many arguments as uh, here. So there is the uh, type of keys, the type of the clear text, which is going to be the set of all bit strings, the type of the ciphertext, um, again, all bit strings, the encryption function, the decryption function, this inch bird function that we have seen uh, in the slides, the Z function that we have also seen in the slides that maps a B strings to B string of zeros of the same length. And finally, the probability of breaking the NCPA property. Similarly, for the MAC, you uh, define a probability symbol PMAC and you call a macro uh, SUFCMA deterministic MAC that takes as argument uh, the type of the MAC key, the type of uh, the messages that you can MAC. So here is going to be all B strings. The type of the max. So here is going to be this type uh, max. The name of the MAC function, the, the name of the verification function, and the probability of breaking the SUFCMA uh, property of the MAC. Uh, Then you uh, say which security property you want to prove. 
So here I want to prove the secrecy of the bit B. Then I declare the concatenation function. So here uh, I'm answering a bit uh, a question that there was before. So this concatenation function takes uh, bit strings on max and returns bit strings. And there is an annotation here, data, which says that this function is injective. And furthermore, you can efficiently compute the inverse. So it says that from the B string result, you can compute the MAC and the, the B string that was that were concatenated together. And obviously, uh, in practice, it's possible only because the length of the MAC is known and fixed. And then you have the declarations that we have seen on the slide. So the full ANC function, the left or right encryption oracle, and uh, the full process uh, that contains the start uh, oracle and then calls the left or right encryption oracle, which is uh, defined here. So basically in this file, I split into two parts uh, what I showed in a single process. So we, uh, all this was grouped in a single process in the slides. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, I can try to run this. Uh, perhaps I can increase the font a little bit. Right, so uh, let me run CryptoVerif. On this example, so it's uh, on Crip, then Mac, and CPA. Okay. So, uh, what you see here uh, is um, that CryptoVerish tries to do a bunch of game transformations. Then uh, it says that it has proved the property. I'm not going to explain the one session secrecy, it's a technical detail. Uh, let's skip that. But what we want in the end is that. It proves the uh, secrecy of the bit B. And what, once it has managed to prove the property, it's going to display the proof, which consists of the initial game and then a bunch of transformed games. So it's going to explain what it does here. Uh, this is perhaps not really understandable for you right now, it's, it's normal. Uh, and then this is the second game and another transformation and the third game and so on. And at the end, uh, it says that it has proved the secrecy of the bit B in the uh, final game, which is game eight. Uh, there, is, there are some computations here, uh, intermediate computations of the advantage of the adversary. And here CryptoVerif concludes that it has, it has proved the secrecy of the bit B up to a probability, which is two times the probability of breaking the encryption scheme. And uh, here you have the time of the adversary, time one, which is uh, explained here, which is the time of the adversary against the wall uh, scheme plus uh, the time uh, for the context, which is detailed here. So I'm going to explain a little bit more the time uh, in the slides. And finally, it concludes that it has proved all queries that you, you wanted to prove. So now I'm going to explain all this in details in the, in the slides. Okay, let's go. So let me see if there are perhaps a few questions. Um, so, yeah, there are some questions, uh, perhaps uh, more on the beginning of the talk, but let me try to answer. Um, so the type of M in uh, such that M in the get, so it's a Boolean, and indeed it's the same as the type of M in the if. So if, if, if M here, uh, M is also a Boolean in the if then, L, if then else construct. Uh, how is the scope of the then clauses defined? Uh, so the, uh, the scope of the then is the rest of the code. So you cannot uh, write an if then else and then after uh, the if then else execute something else. 
So when you have an if then else, you split between the then branch and the else branch until the end of the execution of the code of the process that you write. So this, this leads to some uh, code duplication sometimes, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, that's how the, the language is defined. Uh, the difference of fun and let fun. So fun, it just defines the type of the function and it says nothing on how it's implemented. So it just says that there is a function. Uh, for example, the uh, Mac function, you can say fun Mac uh, that takes argument uh, between uh, key returns Max, and that's give you a fun declaration. When the, with the let fun declaration, you need to give how the function is computed from other functions. Uh, what will happen if we run in CPA game for Mac then encrypt? Will it stop at the game? Uh, so I'm not sure if I understand the question correctly. Um, so the code that you uh, give to Proverif is not going to be really run. What is going to happen is that Cryptoverif is going to do a proof about this code. So uh, it's going to transform the code to try to prove uh, the properties. Uh, and uh, so in the transformations, it's going to stop. Uh, if you apply the, we, we will see, we apply the NCPA property to, to the MacDen encrypt, and then it's going to transform the, the initial game into a, a game on which you can uh, prove the property. Okay, so about the fun versus let fun. So fun is a declaration and let fun is definition. You can say that, yes. Uh, then where is concat defined? So concat is not defined. You just tell uh, CryptoVerif that there is a function concat and uh, the data annotation says uh, that this function concat is injective. And that's all that CryptoVerif knows about concat. So concat can be any function that is injective and uh, it's enough for CryptoVerif to do a proof about uh, this uh, protocol. So let me continue with the talk. So uh, we have this uh, indistinguishability property, which means um, that the game uh, Q1 is uh, indistinguishable from Q2 up to probability P. So it means that the adversary has at most probability P of distinguishing these two games, uh, Q1 and Q2. So P is in fact a function of the adversary. So more precisely, is a function of the runtime and of the number of queries that the adversary makes to our calls. And then we have properties of this uh, relation, so it's reflexive. A process is obviously indistinguishable from itself. It's symmetric. It's also transitive. So if I know that Q is indistinguishable from Q prime and Q prime is indistinguish indistinguishable from Q second, then Q is indistinguishable from Q second. And the probability of distinguishing is the sum of the probabilities, obviously. And you can also make proofs by reduction. So if you know that Q is indistinguishable from Q prime, and there is an adversary C that calls the oracles of Q or Q prime, then you can uh, compose the two and uh, say that C of Q is indistinguishable from C of Q prime. And the probability of distinguishing, so suppose that you have an adversary C prime against uh, C of Q or C of Q prime, this adversary, the C prime, has a probability P prime of C prime of distinguishing the two games. And uh, this probability is P of C prime of C. So it's the same probability as the probability for the adversary C prime composed with C to distinguish Q uh, from Q prime. So it's, it's basically proved by reduction, even if the notations are uh, perhaps a bit unusual. Uh, and then uh, CryptoVerif 
um, will uh, use this notion to uh, perform proofs by sequences of games. So it transforms an, an initial game G0 into an indistinguishable uh, game uh, using uh, either indistinguishability properties given as axioms. So these are the security assumptions and the primitive. So when you have an assumption and the primitive, it must always be written as uh, an indistinguishability axiom saying that L is indistinguishable from R. Then a uh, crypto verif is going to use this uh, property inside a bigger game. So it starts from a game G1, and then it wants to apply the property. What it's going to do is to show that in fact, G1 can be decomposed into some adversary interacting with L, so calling the oracles of L. Then it's going to replace L with R, uh, still inside the same adversary using the axiom. And then it's going to reformat a little bit the game so that it, it is uh, written in a simpler way without making an explicit uh, interaction between C and R PM. And then that gives G2. So that's basically how it applies the assumptions on cryptographic primitives. And then there are a bunch of syntactic transformations to simplify games. Uh, for example, if you know that something is true, you can uh, remove branches for some test or you can replace variables with their values and so on. So using all these transformations, you obtain a sequence of games starting from a game G0, and then it's uh, transformed into an indistinguishable game G1, etc., uh, until uh, you get a game GM. And then the initial game G0 is indistinguishable from GM. And so if you prove a property in GM, then you have the same a property in G0 up to an additional probability uh, P1 plus etc plus P. So uh, let's see what happens for uh, in CPA. So in this slide you see again the same uh, definition for the in CPA encryption. And now I want to express that as an assumption on the encryption scheme uh, that I'm using in the encrypt and MAC uh, scheme. Since I want to use it as an assumption, as I said before, I need to uh, write it under the form of uh, a left indistinguishable from right a game. But this is not exactly how it's written here. Okay, here it's not an indistinguishability property. So I need to uh, prove manually a slightly different uh, formulation of the NCPA property to be able to uh, use it as an assumption. So this uh, formulation is here. So here you recognize the equation that I already showed, saying that when you decrypt the ciphertext, you get the clear text. And here you have the actual uh, specification of in CPA, which consists of the indistinguishability between the left part here and the right part here. So in the left part, what happens? We randomly choose a key, K, and then we have an encryption oracle, O ANC, that can be called as most QE times, and that takes as argument a bit string and returns the encryption of that bit string uh, computed by choosing random coins and then uh, calling the onc R function using the, these random coins. So basically, it's the encryption oracle. Now, what do I do in the right hand side? Well, almost the same thing, except that instead of encrypting X, I'm going to encrypt Z of X, where Z is the bit string that has the same length as X, but contains only zeros. And these two games are indistinguishable because by the NCPA property, the adversary cannot distinguish which of two messages I encrypt. So here, the adversary cannot distinguish whether I encrypt X or Z of X. And these two messages have the same length, so it's okay, I can, I can use the left or right encryption oracle to express that the adversary cannot distinguish these two messages. So this is basically what we give to a crypto verif. There is still one addition. We express, we tell crypto verif what is the probability of distinguishing these two games, and is the probability of breaking the NCPA property. And there is a minor syntactic trick here. There is a prime symbol. Why? Well, just because I want to avoid that CryptoVerif goes into a loop, 
So if I use this version, Uncryptoverif transforms the encryption of X into the encryption of Z of X. Cryptoverif can again transform the encryption of Z of X into the encryption of Z of Z of X, and it can go forever. I don't want that. So for that, I, I rewrite the onc R into onc R prime, and then the transformation cannot be applied on onc R prime. So it's just a syntactic trick to avoid the loop. And then you can write that. Uh, so if you see in ASCII syntax, not in LaTeX, but uh, essentially you write th this thing. Uncryptoverif understands that as an assumption on uh, the NCPs. So expressing that the scheme is in CPA. And it can be reused in many pr protocols. So that's why it's included in the library and you don't have to write this manually when you uh, want to prove a property in CryptoVerif. So now how does uh, CryptoVerif perform the proof? So it starts from the initial game, essentially the one that I gave you uh, in the previous slide, except that now the function uh, full onc is expanded, so you uh, create uh, random coins for encryption, you encrypt, the result of that part is put in variable C1, and then you concatenate that variable with the MAC of C1, and that's the real result of the encryption. Then uh, CryptoVerif is going to expand a little bit this code, so uh, here the test is going to be moved uh, outside, and if B is true, then you compute the encryption of M1, and, and that's the code that encrypts M1. Otherwise, you compute uh, the encryption of M2 uh, here, and that's uh, the code that encrypts uh, M2 uh, in detail. So you choose random coins, you encrypt, and then you concatenate with the Mac. Uh, yeah, there is a minor transformation here. CryptoVerif is going to rename the variables into two different names. It's a detail that's, in fact, not very important for the proof, but it happens. Um, and then it's the main step, and CryptoVerif is going to apply the NCPA assumption. And what's going to happen when you do that is that you transform the encryption of M1 here into uh, the encryption of Z of M1, and the encryption symbols uh, become the primed uh, symbol here. Uh, and then there is a probability difference, uh, which is computed from the uh, success probability against the NCPA property of the un underlying encryption scheme. And uh, once you've done that, uh, here you can see that Z of M1 is in fact equal to Z of M2 because we are in the branch, in the then branch of this test here. So in this whole code, we are guaranteed that Z of M1 is equal to Z of M2. So in fact, this term, Z of M1 here, is equal to Z of M2. So in fact, these two branches, the then branch and the else branch, execute the same code, and CryptoVerif can merge. And so you get this. And when you look at this game now, you can see that the bit uh, B is not used at all, and then B is secret. So you have proved that your encrypt and MAC uh, scheme is in CPA. And the result that you obtain is that the probability of breaking the NCPA property for Encrypt and MAC is in fact two times uh, the success probability uh, against uh, NCPA for uh, the, the underlying uh, encryption scheme. And then there are some parameters, so the time uh, of the adversary against the underlying encryption scheme is, is computed on its T, so the time against uh, Encrypt and MAC, plus uh, the time to compute uh, the equality test, the MAC, the concatenation, the Z function, multiplied by the number of encryption queries that you do. Um, on the length of the uh, clear text that you pass to the underlying encryption scheme is in fact the same as the same length as the length of the clear text that you have for the Encrypt and MAC scheme. A side comment is that the factor two is in fact spurious. If you prove manually the uh, in CPA property for Encrypt and Mac, you won't get this factor two. Uh, in fact, it comes from the way uh, CryptoVerif does the proof because 
it uses the property that you can replace x with z of x. So it's going to basically replace the encryption of m1 with the encryption of z of m1, which is the same as the encryption of z of m2. And then it replaces again the encryption of z of m2 with the encryption of uh, m2. And so you have two, uh, in some sense, you have two applications in CPA here. That's why you get this factor two. Uh, another way of saying it is that uh, it comes from the uh, definition of the secrecy. So you uh, define the secrecy of the bit B and uh, this definition of secrecy as a, a form of this, uh, is of this form so is two times a certain probability minus one. And so the factor two that appears in two times a certain probability uh, ends up also uh, appearing uh, here in this uh, probability. Uh, okay, so uh, perhaps I can try to take questions if there are some. Um, Uh, yeah, so there is a question. If you have different sequences of games between two games, but both sequences have different probabilities, P1 and P2, does CryptoVerif find both and output the minimum? Uh, unfortunately, no. So CryptoVerif is going to find one and uh, output uh, that one. Uh, one thing you can do, if you guide it manually, you can arrange so that it does some specific transformations and then it gets the best uh, probability. But uh, in automatic mode, uh, it's just going to try to find one and it's already very happy if it manages to find one uh, sequence of games that gives the proof. Uh, is there a list of security assumptions like in CPA available in CryptoVerif? Uh, yes, it's in the manual. Uh, there, there is, a, is that, uh, Benjamin Johnson, yeah. Uh, uh, why does OANC has only uh, one argument? Uh, yeah, Benjamin already answered, so I think I can skip that. Yeah, the uh, factor two is in around to the definitions that I use. So can CryptoVerif use a hybrid argument to go from one game to the following one? Um, so yes and no. Uh, so it can, um, so basically it, it has to do uh, the uh, game transformations in one step. And so uh, if, you have, if you need to uh, apply a hybrid argument, the hybrid argument needs to be uh, built in into the definition that you uh, give. And so uh, let me perhaps go back to the uh, definition of in CPA. So it's an interesting question. When I have um, the definition of in CPA here, uh, it's here for one key. But in fact, CryptoVerif internally is going to uh, apply a very simple uh, hybrid argument to generalize this definition to n keys. And now, thanks to this new definition with n keys, it can apply the in CPA property for a protocol that uses any number of encryption keys. And in some sense, that's applying in CPA with a hybrid argument. But it's, a, it's only possible for a, a very simple case. And then if you have more complex hybrid arguments that you need to apply, Basically, you need to build them in your definition. So you're going to uh, give more complex uh, indistinguishability axioms that already encode uh, n keys or uh, n users, or depending on what scheme you're, you're talking about. And these uh, assumptions, these axioms already encode the hybrid argument uh, inside.
Okay, um, let me uh, use the second. Um, second part uh, of the proof. So now I want to prove the in CTXT uh, property of the uh, Encrypt and Mac uh, scheme. So let me first uh, define this property. So again, we consider an experiment here in which we choose a key for Encrypt and Mac. And then we uh, consider an adversary that has access to the encryption oracle onto an oracle by which it can test whether decryption succeeds. So this oracle takes as argument a message and is going to try to decrypt that message under the key K. And if the decryption succeeds, it returns true. If the decryption fails, it returns false. So with access to these two oracles, the adversary should return a ciphertext so that the decryption of this ciphertext succeeds. And moreover, this ciphertext is not a result of a call to the encryption oracle, because obviously using the encryption oracle, it's very easy to uh, obtain a ciphertext that uh, decrypts correctly. So if the adversary manages to do that, it means that the adversary has managed to forge a ciphertext that correctly decrypts. And uh, this is exactly uh, breaking the in CPA, uh, the, sorry, the in CTXT property. So uh, the probability of success of an adversary is the probability of uh, success of uh, this experiment. And then the, the success against the in CTXT property is the maximum for all adversaries that run in time at most T, make at most QE encryption queries with messages of length at most LE and at most QD decryption queries with uh, messages of length at most LD. So we want to prove that the uh, Encrypt and Mac uh, scheme satisfies this property. So the idea is again fairly similar to uh, what happens for the NCPA property. Um, we uh, are going to program this experiment uh, in uh, CryptoVerif. So here I am a bit uh, faster. I'm uh, directly showing the uh, code for the whole uh, experiment. So like for in CPA, I have an oracle O start in which I'm going to initialize the game. And for that, I'm going to generate a key for the encrypt and max scheme, which again consists of the encryption key and the Mac key. And then I return. And after uh, this oracle O start, I have two uh, oracles, the oracle for encryption and the oracle for decryption. So for encryption, the oracle uh, can be called at most q -onc times. It takes as argument a bit string m0. It's going to compute uh, the encryption of m0 uh, using the key k and the uh, mac key mk. That's the ciphertext c0. Then uh, there is one uh, thing here. This encryption oracle is going to insert the ciphertext C0 into a list of ciphertext. So this is to remember which ciphertext have been produced by the encryption oracle. And then it returns the ciphertext in question. And then the decryption oracle, it has, uh, it can be called at most QDEC times. And then it takes as argument a ciphertext. First, is going to test if this ciphertext has been produced by the encryption oracle. If yes, uh, then clearly you can uh, decrypt correctly, so I simply return true. I could try to decrypt explicitly, but it's not really useful. Otherwise, so in case the uh, ciphertext is not in the list, I'm going to try to decrypt. If it's different from bottom, then the decryption succeeded. And in that case, uh, first thing, I execute event bad. Why? Well, suppose that uh, your ciphertext C is not in the list of ciphertext produced by encryption. And the decryption uh, succeeds. Then it means that the adversary has broken the in CTXT property. The adversary has provided a forgery C 
And so I execute this event bad that corresponds to the success of the adversary. And I return true because uh, the uh, test uh, for decryption succeeded, so decryption uh, succeeded. Otherwise, as written, I return false, uh, the decryption uh, failed. And what I want to prove in this game now is that this event bad has a negligible probability of happening. So let me show you the demo. Uh, in CTXT, okay. So here you get uh, almost the same file at the beginning. So you have the declarations for the uh, number of calls to encryption and to decryption. You have the types as before. You have the assumptions and primitives as before. Uh, the query is a bit different. So I define an event bad. I declare an event bad. And uh, I have the query here. It says that if event bad has been executed, then false. So it means event bad has not been executed. And this query is going to be proved uh, up to negligible probability. So all properties that uh, CryptoVerif proves are up to negligible probability. Uh, you have the declaration of the concatenation as before. Uh, the definitions for full arc and full deck. I showed on the slides. Uh, here I declare a table for ciphertext that's going to contain uh, bit strings. You have the uh, QAnc oracle, the QDEC test oracle, and um, the process here that groups everything. So uh, the start oracle on the two uh, QAnc and QDEC. So let me run a crypto verif on this. So you have the same pattern. You see all the transformations that uh, CryptoVerif tries. And then you see the proof with the initial game and the various transformations that are made on the next game, game two, game three, and so on. And again, I'm going to explain briefly these games. And at the end, we are happy. All queries are proved. And we have the more precise result here. So it proved even bad implies false up to a probability uh, PMAC, which is a probability of breaking the uh, uh, SUFCME property of the MAC. So let me go back uh, to the slides. Okay, so to explain a little bit uh, internally how uh, CryptoVerif proves. Uh, this uh, in CTXT property, I need to explain the notion of arrays. So in CryptoVerif, in fact, all variable uh, defined under a replication, so under a for each, is always implicitly an array. So for example, the encryption oracle is shown here, and it defines a variable M0, which is um, the, uh, the message that you encrypt. And you don't write that in CryptoVerif, but implicitly there is an index here, which is the replication index ionc. So it means that if I call this encryption oracle in the copy number one, then I'm going to um, assign the variable m0 of index one. If I call it in the copy number two, I'm going to assign variable m0 of index two, etc. Um, it's the same thing for the variable C0 here. It's implicitly an array just because it is defined under the for each. So these arrays cannot be used uh, arbitrarily. They are very well behaved, and this is checked by CryptoVerif. So uh, you can assign only the variables with the current indices. So here I can assign M0 of ionc. I cannot assign M0 of ionc plus one. Uh, it is allowed to define the same variable at several places, but uh, only uh, one definition can be executed for the same indices. So for example, if you have an ifs and else, you can define the variable x in the then branch and in the else branch, because you know that the two definitions are not going to be executed for the same value uh, of the index uh, that can, be, can uh, appear before uh, here if you have an application before. Uh, but it's not allowed, for example, to uh, define x, do some computation, and then redefine x uh, 
to some other value of i. So with these two uh, constraints, we can guarantee that each array cell is assigned at most once. So it means that if you look at all these array cells, you have the history of all values of the variables inside your protocol. So arrays allow you to remember the values of all variables during the whole execution of your system. And then we have a construct that I did not mention so far, which is find which allows you to perform an array lookup. So here, suppose that you do, you define X under some replication for each. So this, it means that X is an array. You can write X of I. And then uh, you have a second uh, oracle here that is going to do a find. So it's going to look for an index J smaller than N, such that X of J is defined. So it means that I have executed the copy number j of this uh, code. And uh, furthermore, y is equal to x of j. So in fact, here I'm looking in the array x for the value y. And j is going to be bound to some index such that uh, y is equal to x of j. So here it allows you to use x outside its normal syntactic scope, which is uh, the process P that follows the definition of X. But using the, the find construct is really the only way of getting access to values of variables outside their scope in this way. Uh, yes, minor comment is when several array elements satisfy the condition of the find, so we have the condition, uh, uh, the read, return index is chosen at random with uniform probability. So it is to make sure that everything is always probabilistic. And in particular, uh, the list that we have seen can be converted into arrays. So here I have a code that inserts a pair M and prime into a list L. And uh, here I have a get that uh, looks in the list uh, L to look for a pair X, Y, such that the first component of the pair is equal to X prime. And then it's going to use Y uh, in some code, uh, P prime of Y. Of y. So uh, this is going to be automatically transformed into this code. So instead of doing the insertion, is going to define two variables, x of i equals to m and y of i equal to m prime. And then the get is going to be implemented as a lookup into the arrays x and y. So I'm looking for some index j such that x of j and y of j are defined. So I have executed this code. And uh, x prime is equal to x of j. So x prime is equal to one of these uh, terms m that have been uh, run in this part. And then I can uh, run p prime, and, but instead of y, I'm going to use y of j, which is the, the second component of the pair for the um, the element that was inserted here. So uh, why do I use arrays and not lists? Uh, essentially is because when you use lists, you need to have explicit uh, instructions to insert elements in the list. And it's not really easy to guess for a tool like CryptoVerif exactly what elements should be inserted in the list and uh, where in the code. So using arrays in this way, I keep that implicit. So um, all variables are always uh, arrays, and I just need to use a find to uh, do the appropriate lookup uh, when I want. Uh, so in the Encrypt and Mac scheme, we use encryption on the Mac. And so far, I did not really define the security assumption on the Mac. So let me do that now. So this is the strong unforgeability and the chosen message attacks. So the intuition is that you want to guarantee the integrity uh, of the message because only someone who knows the secret key can build the Mac. And the formal definition is as follows. So you have an experiment in which you choose a key for the Mac and uh, you have an adversary that has access to the Mac and verify oracles. And the goal of this adversary 
is to return a pair consisting of a message on a candidate MAC, such that uh, this candidate MAC is a correct MAC, so the verify function uh, succeeds. And moreover, uh, it has not uh, been returned by a query to the uh, MAC oracle. Obviously, otherwise it's, it would be trivial for the adversary to uh, obtain a correct MAC. So this experiment uh, defines when uh, the adversary breaks the strong and forgeability property. And then, the, as usual, the advantage of the adversary is the uh, probability of success against this experiment. And we take the maximum over all adversaries that run at most time t and make at most uh, q and q, and q b uh, queries to the various oracles. So uh, we want to use this uh, strong unforgeability property as an assumption uh, in CryptoVerif. And as I said, we need to um, formalize this uh, property as an indis indistinguishability axiom between two games. So we need to modify a little bit this definition so that it fits the CryptoVerif formalism. So let's first try to uh, have an intuition how we can uh, do that. So intuitively, uh, up to negligible probability, uh, the adversary cannot forge a correct MAC. So what does that mean? So it means that, uh, well, we assume that the key for the MAC, uh, K, is used uh, only for uh, generating and verifying MACs. And uh, the verification of the MAC with uh, the call verify of MKT can then succeed only if the message M is in the list or, or the array in cryptographic formalism of the messages whose MAC has been computed and with the, the result uh, T in the protocol. So it means that we are going to be able to replace a call to verify with an array lookup in, in this list of uh, messages whose MAC has been computed. But more precisely, suppose that the call to the MAC function is a MAC of XK, then we replace the call to verify of MKT with a lookup, uh, which is a find that uh, looks for an index J such that X of J is defined, so that corresponds to having called uh, the MAC oracle on X of J. And uh, the message that on which we verify M is equal to uh, the uh, message on which we have uh, computed the MAC. And uh, the uh, tag that we verify is equal to the tag that was computed by the MAC. So if we find such an index J, then the verification function will succeed because T is a correct MAC. So it's, in fact, it's just because that uh, T is equal to MAC of MK. Otherwise, the verify function will always fail, and this is where the uh, SUFCMA assumption is important. Um, this is because uh, when this condition is wrong, it means that uh, the MAC has not uh, returned the tag for the corresponding message uh, M, and hence by SUFCMA, this verification must always fail, so we can return false in this case. So uh, the key here is that we replace verify with this find. And that's what we are going to express in the indistinguishability property. So here is the definition that we use in CryptoVerif. So first you have the verification that when you verify a Mac, it's true. We have already seen that. And then the indistinguishability here. So we consider a game in which you choose a key K for the Mac, and then you give the Mac oracle that can be called at most QM times that returns the MAC. And the verification oracle that can be called at most QV time and returns uh, the result of the verification on uh, message M on the tag T. And in the right hand side, we have almost the same code, except that here we store uh, the value of the MAC in a variable MA. And at the verification, instead of calling verify, we do this find. Uh, it's almost the same as in the previous slide, except that uh, instead of recomputing uh, the MAC, 
here I use the variable MA that contains the MAC computed here. So these two games are indistinguishable by the SUFCMA property of the MAC. And this is here, the probability of distinguishing them is exactly the probability of success against the SUFCMA property. Uh, as for encryption, we use this trick. We replace the MAC with MAC prime to avoid a repeated application of the uh, transformation. Uh, how is uh, CryptoVerif going to transform games when it applies this assumption? Uh, well, first it is going to uh, check that the key K is used only for MAC and verify. And when that's true, is going to replace each occurrence of MAC, so uh, let's say MAC of XIK, with uh, the computation uh, MAC prime of XIK, uh, store that result in the variable MAI, and then use uh, MAI in the rest of the game. And is going to replace each occurrence of verify with a find. And this find is going to look in all arrays, the uh, XI, MAI of the computed max. So in fact, there is one array for each occurrence of the function MAC, and the find is going to look into all these arrays. So now uh, let me explain a little bit uh, the proof that CryptoVerif uh, finds for the uh, um, NCTXT property uh, of the encrypted and MAC scheme. So it starts from an initial game which is the one uh, we uh, saw in the file, except uh, that the uh, functions full onc and full deck are expanded to what they do. Uh, then uh, it's going to encode the insert and get uh, instructions using arrays. So uh, here you uh, store the ciphertext T0 into the variable ciphertext1, which is implicitly an array indexed by uh, ionc. So that replaces the insert. And here we replace uh, the get with a find that looks for an index u such that ciphertext one of u is defined. So we, we have executed this code. And a ciphertext one of u is equal to uh, Sorry, uh, ciphertext one of you is equal uh, to the uh, ciphertext uh, C that we are looking for. Uh, and then uh, if that uh, lookup succeeds, uh, we um, return uh, true. Otherwise we uh, continue with the computation of the exception. So. Uh, then we reorganize a little bit the code. So here we reorganize the code for uh, the encryption uh, clarifying that first we uh, choose uh, random coins, then we compute the encryption using these coins, then we concatenate with the MAC, and we return the result. Uh, here the variable ciphertext1 has disappeared, just because CryptoVerif realized that it could use C0 instead of ciphertext1. It doesn't need a second variable for that. Then uh, you have the find, which is the same as before, except that it uses C0. And uh, here the uh, computation of uh, the decryption is a bit reorganized. So you uh, split the ciphertext, you verify uh, the MAC, you try to decrypt. And if the decryption succeeds, then the adversary uh, has won because uh, it has uh, produced a ciphertext that decrypted successfully and was not produced by the, uh, the encryption. Uh, Oracle. Otherwise, we return false. Um, then, uh, what happens is the main step of the proof we apply the SUFCMA uh, property of the MAC. So, we replace the computation of the MAC with uh, MAC prime and we store it in a variable ME2. ME and here we replace uh, the verification with a lookup that is going to look in all computation of max here. So it looks for a variable C1 uh, on ME2. 
and it checks that uh, this uh, ciphertext, the, the message C2 that we make is equal to uh, C1 that we have uh, mapped here and the, that the tag uh, that we verify is equal to the tag that we have obtained here. And if that's true, then uh, we return true, otherwise we return false. Uh, then we reorganize a little bit uh, the code again. So here we move the uh, map computation uh, here. And here the find is a little bit reorganized. So if you look here, when the find uh, returns true here, the if is going to go into the then branch. So we're going to uh, use that. But the decryption of C2 is always going to succeed because C2 is equal to C1 of Ri and C1 is an encryption. So when you decrypt, it's always going to succeed. And so we are always going to execute the then branch. So that's what crypto verifier is. So when the find succeeds, it will always execute event bad and then returns true. And when the find uh, fails, it's going to return uh, false because we are in the else branch of the if. So here. Yeah. And that's the last line that is unchanged. Um, now we simplify a little bit more. So let me explain here the properties that we can uh, see. Uh, in fact, here you test whether C2 is equal to C1 of Ri and Mac1 is equal to Ma2 of Ri. But if you look here, C is the concatenation of C2 and Mac1. And uh, C0 is the concatenation of C1 and Ma2. So it means that this conjunction, C2 equals C1 of Ri and uh, Mac1 equals Ma2 of Ri, is exactly equivalent to C equals to C0 of Ri. And then for this reason, the condition that is tested here in the second find is in fact exactly equivalent to the condition that is tested in the first find. Uh, only the index differs, okay? The first find uses index U and the second find uses index Ri, but uh, the condition is, is in fact the same. And for this reason, it means that when the first uh, find fails, the second find is going to fail as well because the condition is the same. So here we are in the else branch of the first find. So we know that the first find has failed and hence we know that the second find will fail as well. So we are always going to execute the else branch of the second find. So this is what crypto prioritizes here thanks to this game transformation. Now the second find has disappeared and uh, CryptoVerif always executes the else branch, which is this, uh, sorry, written false here. Um, and now uh, a miracle has happened. The event bad has disappeared. So we have proved that in this game, the adversary can never uh, manage to execute event bad. And so we have proved the desired property. And so to conclude, uh, we have that um, uh, the uh, in CTXT property is true for Encrypt and Mac, and the probability of breaking it is exactly the probability of breaking the Mac. So I'm breaking the SUS CMA property of the Mac. Uh, so perhaps I can take a few questions. Um, Uh, okay, um, so if I change the example provided in CPA from Encrypt and Mac to Mac and Encrypt, it does not work, why not? Um, so you replace, oh, okay. Um, I think the reason why it doesn't work is that you need an assumption and the function concat. So you need to tell a crypto verif that if conc uh, that when you concatenate uh, these strings, a uh, string of a certain length, 
Um, so let me rephrase. Uh, if you have uh, two messages, M1 and M2, uh, the concatenation of M1 with a MAC has the same length as the concatenation of M2 with a MAC when M1 and M2 have the same length. So this is this property that is probably missing in your example. And it's easy to, to tell that to CryptoVerif by saying that Z of concat of N with a MAC uh, something is uh, equal to uh, concat of Z of M with uh, Z of the MAC. So you express a property of concat, which is true of the concatenation function. And using that property, I think the proof uh, should work. But uh, yeah, obviously, I would need to, to try it out to be completely sure not to, to say something wrong. Perhaps something else might be missing. Um, okay. How does CryptoVerif find the right sequence of games? Does it make a depth first search uh, on all possible moves? Uh, so, in some sense, yes. Uh, perhaps I can uh, take one minute and show you a slide that I have uh, in addition here. Yeah. So, there is a proof strategy, in fact, that uh, CryptoVerif uses to try to find the right sequence of games. So, basically, it tries to execute each transformation given by an assumption on a cryptographic primitive. So it does not going, it's not going to try all the syntactic transformations that it can do because there are just too many of them. But it tries the, uh, the security assumptions on the primitives. And when such uh, transformation fails, CryptoVerif is going to try to analyze why the transformation failed. And then this is going to suggest some syntactic transformations that could make it work. And then it's going to apply this syntactic transformation and retry the cryptographic transformation and continue. But basically, yeah, it tries all the, the possible cryptographic transformations. And, uh, and that's the depth of search. Um, so yeah, somebody suggested uh, using a breath first search instead. So CryptoVerif doesn't do that. And basically the reason is that very often when it starts uh, going into a branch, uh, if, it's, if it's wrong, the transformation can just give you very complex games. So, so trying many branches, it's not going to, to really help. So in general, at least for, except for very simple examples. Um, either you find the proof by using this strategy uh, based on advice and you try each, each transformation and it works, or it goes into something completely wrong and useless and, and then you need to guide it. In practice, that's what happens most often. Uh, Uh, up to how many participants roles of a protocol can we model in with CryptoVerif and up to how many sessions of message exchange can we have? So, well, uh, I guess I modeled the uh, protocols with three, four roles. Uh, you can probably do more if it's uh, not a too complex protocol. Uh, how many sessions? Well, with thanks to the for each, the uh, you can have any number of sessions that you like. It's just a parameter. Uh, inside one session, you can have a fixed number of messages, and that number uh, probably cannot be too huge, but you you can. Uh, three, four, five, uh, six messages without too much problems uh, inside each protocol execution. Um, within the scope of a variable in for each can you access the other? So, yes, you can. So, if you have a for each, you can access the other array elements. Um, 
in the same uh, scope, in the same for each, uh, but you can do that only with a find and the runes uh, are executed uh, sequentially. So the adversary can call the, the oracles in any order, but one oracle is executed after another. So they are not really executed in parallel. The, the interleaving can happen only between full calls to an oracle. Uh, is it possible to have four all statements ranging over arrays in a find? Uh, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Um, so you cannot have for each uh, ranging over arrays. The for each is just on the variable, that's for sure. Uh, but you can express fairly complex conditions in the find, but uh, not for all. So yeah, perhaps I understand the question. The question would be, um, can I express in the condition of, of a find a for all on some other index? Uh, no, you can express existence, but not for all. Um, can CryptoVerif deal with probability theoretic things? AJ union bounds for random collisions, typical PRF. PRP switching stuff. Um, so yes, we can do some probability theoretic things. So we don't need to have a computational assumption, for example, it can be uh, some statistical assumption. Uh, still, uh, if you take the example of PRF, PRP uh, switching, uh, you cannot really do that. Uh, what happens typically is that you can uh, specify a PRF and when you have a PRP, uh, in fact, you specify a PRF plus the, the property that it is uh, injective or bijective. But you cannot really uh, specify exactly the PRP. So basically, in specifying the PRP, you already use the PRF, PRP uh, switching lemma. Uh, I see in section six of the manual that there are no zero knowledge predefined things. Uh, so that's right. Uh, in fact, I never tried uh, modeling zero knowledge uh, properties, uh, zero, zero knowledge schemes in CryptoVerif. Uh, and there might be difficulties in uh, specifying, especially interactive uh, zero knowledge systems in CryptoVerif uh, that may not be easy. Uh, okay, so let me uh, go back uh, to the end of my talk. So, um, so that I already presented. So to conclude, um, I would like to uh, say that CryptoVerif has been tested on a few uh, toy protocols. Uh, here are some names of uh, fairly standard protocols. Uh, they have been uh, studied using uh, Shared key encryption that is assumed to be in CPA on NCTXT, so it's a particular encryption, on the public key encryption scheme, which is uh, assumed to be in CCA2. And for each of these protocols, we have proved the uh, secrecy of the session keys on authentication, so a fairly standard uh, key action security notion. So in most cases, uh, the proof succeeded in proving the desired properties. There is one exception, which is the needle shell public key protocol, when you assume that the action key is the nonce NA. In fact, this happens because CryptoVerry thinks that the leaked nonce NA could be reused to attack the protocol, and in fact, it's not true. So, um, obviously, CryptoVerry always fails to prove the properties that do not hold. So, as I said before, it doesn't find attacks, but the proof the proof fails. So, it's, it's reassuring. Uh, some public key protocols need a bit of manual guidance, so mainly giving the main cryptographic proof steps and the renaming instructions. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so that's like two, three lines of instructions that you need to give. And it's fairly fast uh, with these pro protocols, which are still toy examples, obviously proved in a few seconds. Um, 
there were more ambitious case studies. So the first two here uh, are still fairly very small examples, but uh, of uh, some cryptographic schemes. And then more complex protocols, so Kerberos 5, uh, with and without its PKE init extension, uh, this uh, OEKE protocol, which is uh, a fairly short protocol, but it's a password based uh, key action, so it's, it has some subtleties because of the password. Uh, a small part of an FTA implementation of uh, TLS that was done by Microsoft Research. And then the uh, full uh, TLS 1.3 was verified that it was not an implementation, it was just a model of the, of the protocol. Uh, the SSH uh, transport layer protocol, some avionic protocols that aim to secure a communication between aircraft on the ground. The tech secure protocol, also named Signal, a TLS, which you use every day with HTTPS, a WireGuard, which is a, a VPN protocol, HPKE, which is a recent um, hybrid public key encryption protocol. So many examples. And uh, to summarize, so CryptoVerif can automatically prove uh, security of primitives and protocols. So we've seen two examples of primitives today. Uh, the security assumptions are given as indistinguishability properties that are proved manually once and then can be reused for any protocol that uses uh, this assumption. Then the protocol or the scheme that you want to prove is specified in a, a process calculus. And the tool uh, provides a sequence of indistinguishable game that lead to the proof on the bound and the probability of an attack. And the user can uh, interact with the prover to make it follow a specific sequence of games. So that's useful if some sequence is better than another. Uh, that's also uh, very useful in case the automatic proof strategy fails. Um, in complex examples, it's very common that in fact you need to guide a little bit the tool to obtain the proof. So some uh, future work. So as you see, essentially CryptoVerif is a, a catalog of game transformations that uh, it tries to apply. So uh, many of these game transformations can be improved or, or generalized in some ways. I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. Um, we um, already also aim to combine uh, CryptoVerif with the tool EasyCrypt that you're going to hear about uh, tomorrow. So one idea would be to prove uh, properties of primitives in EasyCrypt and then uh, use them as assumptions to prove protocols in CryptoVerif, for example, because uh, CryptoVerif tends to be better at proving protocols and EasyCrypt better at proving primitives. Uh, it would also be interesting to prove implementations of protocols in the computational model. So CryptoVerif can already generate implementations in OCaml that are uh, proved secure. Uh, essentially, you prove the, the implementation in CryptoVerif and then you uh, uh, implement it, uh, you generate the implementation by a spe specialized compiler. Uh, it's we are also planning to extend it to uh, generate implementation in FSTAR, and uh, Benjamin is, is working on this. So um, essentially, the advantage here is that we could prove security properties um, in CryptoVerif and translate them in FSTAR and then make further proofs using these properties uh, in FSTAR. And it would also be interesting to improve the support for state, so it's a fairly long term goal, but. Uh, supporting loops with mutable state inside the CryptoVerif models would be interesting. And also uh, having support for primitives with internal state. So let me take quickly a few questions and then I need to uh, let uh, Benjamin talk. Um, okay. So first quantum uh, things, uh, so, so I did not uh, look at post quantum uh, protocols in, uh, in CryptoVerif. Uh, one thing that may be true, but uh, yeah, this needs to be checked, but it, it's possible that the transformations that CryptoVerif applies are uh, sufficiently basic that they remain valid even in a quantum setting. So it would not prove a post-quantum protocol, but it might prove 
the protocol that the protocol remains secure in the post quantum case, but uh, that needs to be checked. Uh, most important differences between CryptoVerif and Tamarin. Um, so I would say the most important difference is the basic model in which the tools work. So CryptoVerif works in the computational model, Tamarin works in the, in the symbolic model. So that's the main, the first difference. And all the other differences are almost consequences of that. So in the symbolic model, it's easier to find the tax than in the computational model. Uh, and uh, typically, it's also more difficult to find proofs in the uh, computational model than to automate the proofs in the uh, symbolic model. So that's probably why a crypto verish may be a bit more difficult to use than Tamarin, for example. Um, support for cyclic group Diffie-Hellman. So we do support uh, Diffie-Hellman properties in uh, crypto memory. So we have uh, computational Diffie-Hellman, uh, gap Diffie-Hellman, uh, decisional Diffie-Hellman, and so on. And furthermore, we have very good uh, support for uh, special Diffie-Hellman groups, which are not cyclic groups, like uh, curve to 5509. So we have exact sound properties for, for a group like curve to 5509 which are often not precisely uh, modeled in manual uh, cryptographic proofs. There's a question, how can I change the output type of Z to max? So if you uh, define Z uh, using the macro for uh, encryption, the output type of Z is always going to be uh, the type of clear text of the encryption scheme. So to change it, you need to um, change the argument of uh, what is the clear text of your macro uh, when you apply the NCPA macro. Uh, is there a connection between ProVerif and CryptoVerif? So basically, these are independent tools, but they try to be compatible in terms of input. So for not too complex examples, you can have a single input file that you can feed to both ProVerif and CryptoVerif. And then ProVerif follows you to uh, quickly evaluate whether there is an attack uh, or uh, whether the protocol is secure in the symbolic model. And then the natural way is to go to CryptoVerif as a second step and try to do a proof in the computational model, which is a stronger property. Okay, thanks a lot. I need to let uh, Benjamin talk. Uh, do we take a very short break, perhaps, uh, if that's, that's okay to you, Benjamin, uh, like uh, five minutes and then uh, we start. Uh... Yeah, I think that's a good idea. So I could start at, Oh, I don't know which time zone I should use now, but uh, yeah. Can say five minutes or I can 10 minutes? Five, let's say five minutes because uh, Benjamin needs to have some time to, to talk. So. Okay. Then I'll set the time. Uh, I'll share the screen. So that's going to be 12.35 UTC. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, see you soon. Okay. Okay, so welcome to the second part of the CryptoVerif tutorial. Uh, in this part we are looking at uh, a bit more complex example a protocol with uh, multiple messages namely signed Diffie-Hellman authenticated key exchange and what's new here is that we'll model a random oracle and we'll use a computational Diffie-Hellman assumption we we'll prove key secrecy for the shared secret using the very secret command that Bruno already used and we'll prove authentication properties using correspondence between events. So I'll introduce a bit more on events in CryptoVerif. 
and we'll model a public key infrastructure using a table in CryptoVerif. This will be useful if you go uh, to the end of the exercises that we uploaded. So a quick uh, introduction of the protocol we are looking at, uh, scientific Hellman, so a two-party protocol. We suppose that each party has a signature key pair. So A knows its private key and uh, B's public key and vice versa. So we start by A generating a fresh random exponent and then sending an initiation message to B. Basically, uh, we send two identities and then the ephemeral public key. And now B will also sample a random exponent and then create a signature over the two identities and the two public um, uh, the ephemeral public keys under its private key. And now what's new here, we'll record an event, begin B, and it has parameters. It has the two identities and the ephemeral public keys as parameters. And we will record that to the trace if you want to say. And uh, the second message of the protocol will be the two identities, B's ephemeral public key and a signature. Now A will verify the signature and if it verifies, it will continue to create a signature uh, to or the same message, but under its private key SKA. And now A can create the uh, compute the, the Diffie-Hellman um, shared secret with G B to the A and derive the final shared secret by hashing it. And we record an event end A because now A should be convinced that B um, uh, sent this message and they have a shared secret together. And we'll send back just a signature to B. And now B can verify the signature and if it verifies also compute the shared secret and record an event end B with the identities and ephemeral public keys as parameters. So let's look at what we want to prove here. We want to prove that the shared secrets are secret and uh, in the sense that they are indistinguishable from uh, random bit strings of equal length. And we'll do that with the very secret uh, we already introduced. And then we want to prove authentication and that um, mutual authentication to be precise. So we want to prove that if A is convinced to have concluded a session with B, then B actually started such a session and also explicitly for these ephemerals. And what we will do as a query in CryptoVerif is write query that for all um, group elements X, Y, so basically ephemeral public keys, for each event end A, there exists a distinct event begin B. So if A ends a session, also B actually started the session. And for the other um, side, it's actually um, the same. So uh, we we'll, we write a query that for all group elements, if we have uh, for each event end B, so if B is convinced to have finished the session, then there was actually a distinct uh, session started by A. We we'll base this proof on the following cryptographic assumptions. We we'll, we'll, uh, use that hash is a random oracle and uh, that we have a probabilistic UF CMA secure signature and that the CDH assumption holds in the group that we use. And now in the following, I will step-by-step step show um, how we construct the CryptoVerif model for this protocol. This is basically the contents of the file signed dh.ocv that you find in the tutorial uh, GitHub repository. Um, you might want to do a git pull to get the most recent version. And if you want and you have enough screen space, you can look at this file at the same time while I present the contents. I, I not present them in the order like um, line by line, but like in a logical order. Okay, so let's see, how do we model a signature? 
here you will see that it's a bit similar to the modeling of a Mac. So first we need to define types. As it's, um, so first we need to define types for the keys. So we have a key seed type and the type for public keys and secret keys. So you already saw the fixed annotation. What we didn't see yet is the bounded keyword here. It means that uh, bit strings in this type have, a, have an upper limit. Uh, now the choice here bounded for public keys and secret keys we could also choose fixed if we if we model the actual bit string representation, but you can also say that you model like the abstract mathematical representation of public keys and secret keys, and they might have different sizes. So that's up to you. The CryptoVerif manual will actually tell you if for certain types you have to choose certain annotations. That's in section six that was uh, mentioned in the Zulip chat already. And we need to define two names for probabilities. P sign is the probability of breaking the UFCMA property, and P sign call is the probability that independently generated signature keys will collide. Now let's look um, how we instantiate this macro. You have all already seen in Bruno's code how we expand macros. That's with the expand keyword and then the name of the macro that you find in the CryptoVerif manual. And I just want to add here that usually the, the order of parameters is that first there's the names of the types used by this um, macro, then the names for the functions defined inside the macro because usually the functions are declared inside the macro, and finally names for the probabilities. So let's look inside this um, this macro. So this is nothing you need to write in the signed DH file. I mark slides with lib in brackets for uh, contents that I present that uh, are inside the CryptoVerif standard library. So we declare two functions, skGAN and pkGAN, that take a key seed and return the appropriate key type. We have a verify function that returns the bool and a sign function that returns a signature. So because here we use a probabilistic signature, it takes a signature seed. But what this macro also does for us is define a convenience let fun that wraps this random seed generation for us. As you see, it takes only a message and the private key and internally it will generate the signature seed like the random coins and call the probabilistic um, signature function. Um, if you have a different order in macros, I mean, you can define your own macros and uh, it's basically, you can compare it with calling a function if you want. I mean, the, the function declaration defines the order of parameters and the function call, uh, the, the expansion of the macro must use the same um, order, but you can define uh, macros as you want. It's actually only a conve convention, this order of, uh, of parameters. Okay, what I do not show here is how CryptoVerif defines the correctness of the signature because that's defined as for the Mac and you already saw that on Bruno's slides. So I will continue and talk about Diffie-Hellman. So as Bruno mentioned, um, CryptoVerif can handle a lot of different groups. And here we'll just use a very basic group. We only need uh, that some collision probabilities are negligible. So we define two types for the exponents Z and uh, the group elements G and two probabilities. And then we can expand the macro um, giving these the names of the types. Then here, this is interesting. We need to give a name for the groups generated. That will be a constant and the name for the exponentiation function. Actually twice, we also need to give a second name. And that's as with the Z, Z prime thingy that was uh, mentioned on Zulip. After a, um, a Diffie-Hellman transformation, CryptoVerif will have replaced exp by exp prime 
and it's just a technicality to avoid infinite loops. So basically it knows that for X prime invocations, we do not want to apply any transformation anymore. We have a multiplication function for exponents and then the two um, collision probabilities where the first one is probability that G2 a fresh exponent would collide with an independently chosen public key. And the second one corresponding to the probability that G2, the multiplication of two freshly chosen exponents would collide with an independently chosen uh, group element. All right, so that's what we need to put in, in our file. And just inside quickly, the macro will define the function for the exponentiation, taking a group element and an exponent, a constant for the generator, the multiplication function, it will define that it's commutative. And here, this equation here is interesting. It, uh, well, it defines the, the Diffie-Hellman property, basically, that uh, g to the x to the y is the same as g to the x, y. All right, and then separately, we need to instantiate uh, Diffie-Hellman assumption. There is CDH, DDH, gap Diffie-Hellman, random self-reducibility, a whole bunch of them. You can find them in the manual. Here, we'll just use CDH. And for this macro, we also need to give almost the same names as before. So I will not uh, explain that. Just to quickly recap what CDH is. So the CDH assumption in a group G uh, means that, uh, well, we assume that um, something is happening only with an negligible probability, and that is that the adversary given two group elements, g to the x, g to the y, where the exponents are cho chosen uniformly random, will compute the correct g to the x, y. Okay. So that's for Diffie-Hellman. The last assumption I have to present is the random oracle. So to recap what a random oracle is, it's an idealized random function and it returns an independent uniformly random value on new input and the same value on an input it has seen before. So to model this, we, well, we need to see all calls also the adversarial ones. Well, our game must observe them. And here you see already that it's idealized. I mean, how would that work in practice? Uh, function like uh, SHA-256, I mean, the adversary can just compute it. But that's the random oracle assumption, and so CryptoVerif can also use it. Uh, we need to define a type for the hash function choice, a fixed type. It's basically like a key. And then we can expand the ROM hash macro. So we give it a type for the hash function, then the type of the input, the type of the output, which we call just key here, because in our protocol, it's the shared secret key, a name for the hash function, and the name for the process that will define a hash oracle. I will talk about that more. And QH, a parameter name, the parameter that will uh, tell how often uh, how many calls we allow the adversary to make uh, to the random oracle. So let's see what happens uh, in the macro. The macro will define the hash function with all the input types. That's just one G here, and it returns a type key. And the first parameter is this hash function choice, this key. And now this modeling works because we will not give this parameter, this first parameter to the adversary. So while the adversary can call this hash function, as it doesn't know the first parameter, it cannot actually compute the hash function. We only want to, do, to let the adversary do that in a controlled way. And for this, the macro defines a process containing an oracle. So here the param is just the definition of this uh, number of calls parameter. The, the process will receive this um, hash function choice parameter. And inside we'll define 
the Oracle O hash that takes as input a value of the input type and just returns the output of the hash function. And it's um, parallelly composed uh, QH times, so the adversary can do QH calls. And this QH parameter will appear in the final um, uh, probability formula. So how to use this? Uh, in our initial game, we need to sample a random function by taking a random value of type hash function. And then in each call, we will use it. We, we have to give it as a first parameter. And we also need to include this hash oracle process that exposes the oracle to the adversary. So let's see how the, ah no, uh, one slide on the random oracle is missing. So what, how does CryptoVerif actually apply this assumption? So again, this is defined in the library. So for each hash function call that appears somewhere in the game, possibly under replication, CryptoVerif will replace this function call by an array lookup and it will compare the input X with all other inputs that are ever used inside the game. So it's a find statement. And it will compare if X is equal to any other XJ or any other um, input given to the hash function. And in this case, return the K that was returned in that other case. And only otherwise sample a new output and use that one. So there will be one find branch per hash call. And in particular, I mean, we expose the hash oracle. So the hash call inside this hash oracle will also be replaced by a find statement. And this way the adversary can receive hash outputs that are used internally in the protocol. Okay, so let's set up the game. So all these definitions, the types, the probabilities, the expansions need to happen before the process keyword. And afterwards we'll define the initial game. And the initial game, we will uh, sample the hash function and then set up the two honest parties signature keys. And for this, I define a convenience key gen function, which generates a key seed and then computes the secret key and the public key and returns them. And so at the end of the initial start oracle, we just return the two public keys such that the adversary knows the honest parties public keys. And this will hand back um, control to the adversary. Now, how does the, uh, the rest of the initial game look like? So let's assume we have defined the number of calls we allow the adversary to, um, to the individual parties. And let's see what we do here. So after the initial uh, start oracle, which I just copied here, we'll have a big parallel composition of different processes. That's the pipe character here. That's it, that's, uh, that means a parallel composition of processes. And in each one, we'll uh, give access to oracles to the adversary. So first, we let the adversary start NA parties A and NB parties B and we let the adversary register NK of its own public key. So we'll have a PKI. Um, the parties need uh, the hash function choice because they will compute the protocol and their own private key. So let's see how we define the PKI. So we need to define a type for the identities. We call it host here and a table to pair a host to a public key and we'll use constants to define the two honest parties. And this, and we'll expose an OPKI Oracle that the adversary can call with a host name and the public key. If this host name happens to be B or A, then we'll just ignore the public key the adversary sent and input the actual public key of this honest party. And otherwise we'll insert a host Z and PKZ. Um, pair into 
the table and later we'll use a get statement to retrieve uh, a key and there we can use the this equal sign um, uh, notation which which says we want to retrieve uh, a pair where the host name is equal to host x and then we'll retrieve that public key okay um, now how do we define the processes and the oracles for the two honest parties this is a multi protocol uh, multi message protocol um, and for each message we'll expose one oracle you see that here we have an oracle oa1 oa3 and the final one and they are just separated by semicolon so they are just executed one after another that means they can only be called in this order you can imagine that there is an implicit session id identifier which actually is the replication index uh, so that means uh, that the adversary can only call oa3 for example for a session if it before called OA1 and it's the same for uh, process B. Okay, um, so the following is just um, the presentation of the actual computations, um, the, the actual uh, computations that are done inside the oracles. Uh, maybe I don't have to explain all of them, but let me do at least um, the first and the second message. Um, so the adversary will instruct um, OA1 to which um, other party it talks. So it can be any, uh, any other party and A will sample uh, a fresh exponent and compute the ephemeral public key and return the message exactly as we had it in the protocol diagram two identities and the ephemeral public key now the ob2 oracle will consume exactly such a message you see it has uh, three parameters two identities and one ephemeral public key now the equal notation here means that OB2 will only accept messages that are actually destined for, for him. Uh, so let's call him Bob, so uh, with pronouns him. So Bob only accepts messages that are only actually uh, sent to, to B. And in this case, uh, B will, um, will also sample um, ephemeral public key pair and then create a signature over the message and uh, record an event begin b and return the message the message is uh, the two identities the ephemeral public key and the signature um, so one thing yeah and the third message um, I, I saw i will only explain the, the the get equals notation here that was posted on zulip um, so if we so uh, a will retrieve the the other party's public key and this equal notation does not assume that there's only one matching entry it can you can have um, multiple matching entries and in this case the semantics is that the get statement will return any one of them with uniform probability Okay, so one thing that's interesting here for the modeling of the um, secrecy um, property, uh, just a meta comment. So, I mean, the tutorial is supposed to be over now, but uh, we're running a bit out of time. So I'll try to, to, to not, uh, be too long but I, I think I still need 10 minutes or so uh, so I hope you can stay um, so what I want to show here is how we uh, model the secrecy property for the secret keys so as you see here for example in, when um, 
B consumes the last message, which is just a signature sent over from A. Um, here we see the computation of the Diffie-Hellman shared secret and then the computation of the final shared secret using the random oracle. So KB is the variable that we want to be secret. However, this um, host Y property here, uh, this host Y variable here uh, can be any host. And, um, but we only want to prove the security property for sessions between the honest parties. Because if B was talking to a host set up by the adversary, then there is no uh, secrecy guarantee. Then the adversary can trivially compute the shared secret. So what we do here is um, do an uh, if condition. We test if host Y is actually equal to A. And in this case, assign KB to a new variable that we call key B. And otherwise we'll just return KB to the adversary because anyway, the adversary is supposed to know it in that case. So he will end up here with a variable key B that is only defined for honest sessions. And we'll do the same thing on the side of A. If A was actually talking to B, then we'll assign K A to key A. And now we can instruct CryptoVerif to prove the key A and uh, the, the key secrecy property for the key A and key B variables. So if you're familiar with um, ECK or ACCE models in cryptography, you, you might know the test session, um, um, the, the notion of test sessions, uh, test sessions. So here in our CryptoVerif model, actually all honest sessions are test sessions. So we prove key secrecy for all uh, keys of these sessions. So I'll just show like a, a formal uh, definition of uh, key secrecy, um, just to be sure uh, it's cryptographically uh, soundly defined. Um, so what CryptoVerif will prove here when you do query secret on such a key variable, it will prove that uh, the adversary cannot distinguish between two versions of the game, between the real game and the random game. So where real is the original game that we define and uh, the random game in which CryptoVerif replaces all keys KA, or I mean, in this case, the variable key A, uh, it replaces all of them by independent uniformly random bit strings of the same length. And this probability will be bound for like uh, adversaries that run at most in time T, start at most NA sessions for A and B for B, and register at most NK public keys and uh, calls the hash oracle at most QH times. For the correspondence queries, we actually need to define the events, uh, declare the events in our file. We just give them names and can say what types they accept as parameters. And then the query, you almost saw them already. Uh, we, we say for each event end A, we want to have a distinct event begin B with the same parameters. And we actually can also add a public vars keyword expressing that we want to prove this property even given that the keys, the shared secrets uh, could leak. And CryptoVerif can prove that. Okay, and the formal definition uh, could be expressed like this. So we, we, we give the adversary access to all these oracles and uh, we want to prove that the maximum probability that any adversary could have is negligible uh, for like uh, that the adversary could produce a sequence of events where there is an end B event that is not preceded by a distinct end A for the same parameters that we saw before. Okay, so that's what I prepared for slides and I quickly wanted to show how, um, how to use this 
how to how to use uh, crypto verif well my uh, crypto verif setup so let's switch to a terminal um, so on the left i have the file open um, i think i won't have time to to say much about it but basically first we have pretty much all the types then the the age group the random oracle we define the this message um, encoding functions, signature, then the keys, then the queries, and finally the processes. So basically in my slides, I showed pretty much all the code. Um, and let's run the proof. Uh, so this is a protocol that CryptoVerif can prove automatically, but I quickly show you how to um, how to um, instruct crypto uh, crypto verif manually also um, just such that you you see this um, the syntax okay so I mean if you only care about asymmet uh, asymptotic security all you need to know is the all queries proved then you're fine but if you're uh, interested in in the actual um, probabilities you can look in the in the output that I prepared already and at the very end you will find lines that start with result proved then it will repeat the query and then give a probability formula that depends on all the um, all the parameters and the probabilities and you find one such result proved line for each query so we'll have one for one authentication query and the other, and then uh, for, for key secrecy as well. Um, if you have questions about the exact presentation of, of these results and the um, runtime of the adversary, we can do that asynchronously on Zulip. So if you want to prove a more complex protocol, you might need to run CryptoVerif in interactive mode. And that's done by adding a proof environment and then writing interactive. And then CryptoVerif will stop and ask uh, for a command. And then you can uh, say crypto and um, then the name of the assumption, in this case ROM. And in brackets, you need to indicate the, the name of the function. So here it's a hash function then you could uh, use UFCMA. And if you, uh, for UFCMA, CryptoVerif will apply it only once. So if you have multiple uses of the sign function, you need to apply it multiple times. And you can tell CryptoVerif to do that directly by adding a star at the end. And now at any time, you can um, write success as a command and then CryptoVerif will try to see if some queries are proved. And now we'll actually see that it outputs proved query inch event, etc. and proved event here as well. But the following queries remain unproved, that's the key secrecy. So that was a bit expected that the signatures already provide us authentication. Uh, but for key secrecy, we first need to apply CDH. So let's do that quickly. And if we do success now, it outputs the proof and says all queries proved. Um, yeah, I think at this point I'll I'll wrap up first and then people who have questions can stay around longer. Um, so this was is just a repetition of what I showed for reference. So what we covered today was an introduction to the syntax and semantics of games in CryptoVerif. Uh, we showed you how to model simple primitives and protocols and how to use different macros and some basic interactive interaction with CryptoVerif. We showed you how to prove secrecy and correspondence properties and like very basic intuition how to interpret the final result. Um, so the next steps for you would be uh, 
like I mean we encourage you to try the exercises there's a PDF in the tutorials github repo and you can reach us on the Zulip during the next days and we'll happily answer your questions and debug your code and um, I think, yeah, the reference manual was already mentioned several times. You can also look at the examples directory in the CryptoVerif uh, installation, like when you download the tar file or if you look at the virtual machine there, the example directory is there. Just beware, it could spoil you for the exercises. And it's best that you look for .ocv files because they use the so-called Oracle frontend syntax that we presented in this tutorial. CryptoVerif also has another front and another syntax, which we call the channel syntax. That's the syntax that's compatible with ProVerif, just uh, for reference. And uh, you're also invited to subscribe to the mailing list. I, I just put a link here for the web form to subscribe to the mailing list. It has low activity, so uh, don't be afraid. We, we announce um, uh, new releases, uh, tutorials, and you are also uh, invited to send questions there uh, as soon as the Zulip is no longer active. Okay, and this last slide is just uh, giving references for the, the papers in which CryptoVerif's um, algorithms are introduced. Okay, so thanks. That's um, what I prepared so far. And uh, if you want to stick around for questions, I think Bruno and me are happy to stick around a bit. Ah, okay, so the commands that were given, proven, okay. So I also uploaded this file to the, um, the, uh, the GitHub repo, so you can look at it there. And basically we have one crypto command for each, um, Uh, cryptographic assumption that we want to use. So that's three here. If you look at the uh, proof output, you'll see that CryptoVerif actually produces 43 games. And that's because it uh, very in, in great detail uh, describes all uh, transformation, it's even if it's only um, syntactical ones. Uh, limitations in PCV files. Maybe that's a question for Bruno. Uh, well, uh, there there are no real limitations. It's just a, a difference in, of syntax. Uh, is because uh, uh, PCV syntax is closer to Proverif and uh, easier to understand for people that come from the world of formal methods on the Pi calculus. And the OCV syntax is closer to crypto games and easier to understand for cryptographers. But other than that, there's no difference. Are there any other questions? So there just came in one question about integration with EasyCrypt uh, or FSTAR. Bruno, maybe that's for you as well. You know more about the state of the EasyCrypt uh, one. Well, so, so it's very preliminary and work in progress, but the, the idea is that these assumptions that uh, we give to CryptoVerif uh, the goal is to translate them into uh, EasyCrypt games and then uh, prove these, uh, these properties in EasyCrypt. That's basically the idea. And about F-star as well? So F-star, uh, well, uh, this one is, is perhaps for you, uh, Benjamin, since it's your work. Yeah. <laughs> so for F-star, that's uh, my last uh, PhD project. So. 
the goal here is to um, to unify a bit um, the two worlds. So CryptoVerif uh, proves security on a high level of the protocol, right? So we take a specification of the protocol and prove cryptographic properties for it. But we actually do not say, uh, for example, I mean, in CryptoVerif, we don't say what the exact group is or what the exact hash function is, etc. Et um, but if you implement the protocol, you need to do that. And now it could happen that when implementing the protocol, um, mistakes happen and you're actually not implementing the same protocol as the one that was proven in CryptoVerif. So to, to eliminate this error, uh, one possibility is to generate code from the specification and the proof assistant. So from CryptoVerif in this case, and uh, we will see something else in the EasyCrypt tutorial tomorrow. And um, what we want to do now is to generate F star code from a CryptoVerif model. And also to, I mean, and that, that has already been done for OCaml code. So you can already, as Bruno said, generate OCaml implementations from CryptoVerif specifications and they run and they, they um, keep the security properties proven in CryptoVerif. Um, but they do not contain any more um, annotations of these security properties. I want to say these security properties are not visible in the OCaml code itself. So what we want to do for the F-star extraction is to try to also express in F-star's type system the cryptographic properties that were proven in CryptoVerif such that we can then use them for uh, proofs in F-star to build upon these properties. And that's um, work in progress. And I hope uh, we can present uh, some paper on that at some point. <laughs> All right, I think we've gone over by quite a bit now. And maybe yeah. we should just have other questions to Zulip and... Uh... Um, yeah, so I, let's I, thank, I apologize, uh, I, I was wrong good on uh, I expected this. Uh... Well, this is very interesting. I think a lot of people got a lot out of this. So let's thank uh, virtually uh, Bruno and Benjamin and Benjamin for their amazing uh, presentation. I hope a lot of you got uh, enough out of that taster that you can go and explore on your own. As Benjamin already said, uh, we will be present on Zulip for the next couple of days at least. So you can ask questions, post your solutions, get us to debug your stuff. And after that, you can always communicate directly with uh, Benjamin and Bruno on the crypto verify mailing list or, or directly if you so wish so wish to. So thanks everybody. This is the end of the day of day one of this tutorial. And we'll start again the same time tomorrow morning, 8.30. Everything was prompt today, so you expect to be prompt tomorrow as well. So if you want to learn more about F-Star and EasyCrypt, see you tomorrow. And thanks for being here today. And thanks to all the uh, organizing team, including Srinivas and his students and postdocs who have been making this work amazingly well. Thanks, it's our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno and Benjamin. Thanks. Benjamin. Bye, everybody. So, shall I close this session? I think yes. Yeah. You need you need to throw us out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, I'll do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, bye. Thank you so much. <laughs>